o máximo que and most we can state is that inflation is going to go up in Brazil. That's the trend for the dollars to go down and go to go up, and so on and so forth. The trend is going to be inflation in the states, and that's what we can say. Now, what's going to be the inflation rate in the year? I don't know, and that's in scientific. I don't know. Nobody can know. Not even at, not even the central bank, even though they they might think differently. And, and especially the Ministry of Finance, and it, because he doesn't know anything about inflation rate or economic or political economy. Unfortunately, I'd like to say, I have to say that. In economics, which is my main field of study, the economy of economics of Austrian school, I think I have three times or something. Three times? So I could sum up saying that we Austrians study markets in a different way, different from the mainstream. We don't see markets in equilibrium as a monopoly or monopolist uh, competition. We see markets as processes. They're always converging to equilibrium, even though they never reach this balance. Because the main elements of this theory are that the markets are driven by human action, both in the supply and the demand sides, and this takes place over dynamic time. In every instance, there is a learning, and third, transactions take place according to limitation and propagation of knowledge, and fourth, markets are spontaneous orders, so they are subject to ongoing changes, and fifth, human action is subjective. So how can you expect any equilibrium in such a scenario? And the business function that has been explored by Mises, by Erta Soto and many others, other scholars, is the individual capacity to perceive possibilities for gains that exist in markets. So, summing up, the business function is a category within the general concept of human action. Human action can be considered as a business phenomenon, more specifically an action that stresses creative and coordination capabilities by agents. And one of the speakers here is, on, is one of the speeches here is on entre entrepreneurship, so I'm going to skip. I don't want to go into this. I'm concerned with my time. Even though I'm a Brazilian, I, I do like to, to be sharp. Just one minute. It's a pity I didn't see this before. Now, the debate on economic uh, calculations is a well-known topic. Around the 20s, Mises said that socialism was doomed to failure and said, why? Summing up, socialism does not cover private property. So it doesn't make sense to talk about markets in, according to the socialist market. If there's no market, then there's no price. And if there is no price, then economic calculation becomes impossible. So he said that socialism was going to fail, as it did, as it goes on happening, unfortunately, for some people. The other topic is that monetary theory. The Austrian monetary theory can be summed up according to five points. First, the effects of the variations of, the st of, of currency do affect relative prices, capital structure, and standards of production and economics, and change the levels of employment according to the production levels. Mises said this in 1912. The second point is that the economic cycles are a phenomenon that even though they manifested in the real sector of economics have exclusively monetary causes. It's always the central bank's fault, right? The third is that the currency as any other asset has a value decreed by the principle of marginal utility. As Mises demonstrated in his 1912 book, his treaty in German, I never get it right in German, you know, let's try to teach me about 10 times. The theory of credit and currency, Mises, proved this, that currency depends on the marginal utility. The fourth is that inflation 
should be defined not as it's simply defined, as continuous increase, internalized increase of price. This is the effect, but the cause is just one, is that the price, uh, the price of goods is of some goods is more is higher because of the supply that it's more restricted so inflation is the issuance of bills without origin so the inflation we have in Brazil and the world has been like planted and sold three or four years ago where's the fifth point is that the currency is a spontaneous order in the theory of capital, which is the next topic, my one minute is gone. Now I need another minute. Here's an element that no doubt makes a difference between the Austrian theory with any other competing theories, because these other theories, macroeconomic, you don't have a theory of capital. Their capital is constant. It's just a K a symbol. It's something that is completely not realistic. And those, and no doubt, Bom Bavard has been contributed a lot to the theory of capital, following a tradition that was started by Menger. And the central bank and its concept of the capital considers many steps that a good starts being uh, produced until it's finished. And these stages correspond to the structure of capital. Therefore, capital is not homogeneous and not constant, as macroeconomic models would say. It's heterogeneous and it varies according to the several other productive factors over time. And now the theory of the economic cycles, which, which is one of the topics I've always loved writing about, that has been designed by Mises in his 1912 treaty, developed by Hayek in the 30s, in his controversy with Lord Kenzie, and has been improved by other thinkers of the Austrian school. And among which we have Roger Garrison, uh, who uses charts and things that the purest uh, Austrian thinkers would be scandal. But it helps uh, comparing how uh, Austrian think, Austrians think compared to other economists. This theory can be summarized pretty briefly. Here's the theory of the currency of the capital of economic cycles. At the same time, it shows how the issuance of bills of currency uh, decreases tax rates and fools agents because they would believe that it's, it means more savings, so they start investments, longer term investments, and thereby they expand the structure of economic capital. Later, when they find out that it, was, it wasn't about savings, but it was a it was the currency disguised as savings, then the tax rate goes up, and this leads to shrinking of the structure of production. This phenomenon produces unemployment that became known as something that shrinks and, and grows up, like a folding effect that is higher when in sectors that are further from the production of final goods. So inflation ends up leading to unemployment, as opposed to what Keynesian thinkers say. As Hayek said, there is no choice between eating too much and having an indigestion, which would mean recession here. When you issue more than what you have when you eat too much, then in, in the indigestion will come as an inflation. If you look at the charts of central banks in Europe, in the US, and here in Brazil, in terms of issuance of bills, you'd say that inflation has been sold and then it's going to bear its fruits. And the, the conclusion is that unemployment is the natural cause of inflation shows how wrong our Keynesian analysis that became known as the Phillips curve, who championed the existence of a trade-off between inflation and employment. I hate seeing this here. 
There is no such trade-off between inflation or unemployment. The September 2008 crisis could be perfectly explained by the business cycle theory from the Austrian school. And it does explain any other crisis, as Murphy will explain to you later. And finally, our conclusion is that action, time, and knowledge is a fascinating universe of the Austrian School of Economics. Here's its cornerstone. I'd like to finish by saying that after two decades studying the Austrian School, I'm completely convinced that the stone that the builders of economics have been rejecting is actually its cornerstone, and that the duty of e Austrian economists is to try to show this to the world for their own good. Thank you. That's what I had to say.